Great. Uh, again, good evening, and thank you for joining us for a discussion on gender identity and the importance of pronouns with Dr. Shannon Peters of Boston University. Tonight, we're going to learn about terminology surrounding sexual orientation and gender diversity, how sexuality and gender are seen on a spectrum, and why gender pronouns are becoming more prominently used in society today. Uh, Dr. Peters lectures in, writes about, and presents on several topics, including impacts of systemic oppression, discrimination, and trauma on, mental health, uh, on the mental health of marginalized individuals, uh, transgender health care and mental health, and gender-based violence response and prevention. Uh, Dr. Peters has been published in the Journal of Social Issues, the Journal of um, uh, Social and Personality, uh, the Psychology Compass, and the General Hospital Psychiatry. You can tell I don't know my journals. I'm sorry, uh, Shannon. Uh, Dr. Peters has been presented uh, has presented at the American Psychological Association annual convention, the annual Association of Women in Psychology Conference, and the National Multicultural Summit. She earned a BA in Behavioral Neuroscience from Purdue University, an MS in Mental Health Counseling from UMass Boston, and a PhD in Counseling Psychology from UMass Boston. So let's all please give a big virtual round of applause to Dr. Peters for joining us tonight. And Dr. Peters, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Awesome, thank you so much. I very much appreciate the introduction and I am so thankful to the 171 people who are here to learn about gender diversity and what pronouns are and, and how to use them. So thank you so much for taking an hour out of your evening. So um, Robert just did a great job introducing me um, and shared a lot of this information already. So again, my name is Shannon Peters. I use she, her, hers pronouns. If that kind of labeling pronouns is not something you're familiar with, we're gonna talk about it a lot today. And um, I specialize in providing therapy to individuals within the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer um, plus community. I myself identify as a white cisgender queer woman. Um, and again, if those terms are newer to you, we're gonna go over all of them today. So uh, what we're gonna cover today is we're gonna talk about sexual orientation and gender diversity terminology. We're going to talk about sexuality and gender being on a spectrum and do an exercise or kind of talk through an image that um, you can then do as an exercise on your own if you'd like. Uh, we're gonna talk about gender neutral pronouns, what they are and why to use them. Um, I do wanna give a trigger warning for this section that I do provide some information about um, suicide rates in the transgender community. So just to know that that content will be part of this presentation. And then we should have plenty of time for questions. Um, I anticipate I'll be talking for about 35, 40 minutes and we should have a solid 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Um, so we also wanted to just talk through some agreements for creating a safe learning space. So this is in webinar format, um, but, the, but there's the option to, you know, be chatting or be asking questions. And so we want to come into this virtual space with uh, respect for others, openness to new ideas or opinions. I might pre be presenting information that is new to you or an opinion that is different from one you've heard before. Um, also assuming good intention with questions. Um, so recognizing that what we say and how we say it can have an impact on others. And also this is a place for learning. So we want you to be asking those questions you have and know that those are coming with good intentions um, so that you can get some answers. And also um, practice imagining what it is like for someone else. So a lot part of this um, presentation, if you are not part of the trans community is kind of thinking through what, um, what the experiences are for someone within the transgender community. Okay, so I also like to start this presentation uh, with one of my favorite quotes. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. 
So thinking about how the intention here, if you are not part of the trans community, is not to go in and save the trans community. It's not to um, to kind of use our our kind of what we think is best for the trans community, but recognizing that we all have varying levels of oppression and of privilege. And how can we relate to how by supporting the transgender community, we are supporting liberation um, and freeing oppression more generally. So before I get into some terminology, I would like you all to just take a moment to reflect on these, um, on your own gender and your memories um, of when you first kind of became aware of gender. And just take a moment to think about what do you recall um, in, in these earliest memories of gender? What, you know, how do your memories vary across age? What messages about gender did you receive from others in society? And how did this impact your understanding of gender? So just to start us off with really exploring just for yourself for a moment, how what your relationship is to gender. I'm just gonna give 30 seconds for people to just think about that. Okay, I hope that, yeah, just puts you in a receptive space of um, just as we're going to be talking about gender for the next 45 minutes. So I'm going to move us on to talking about some terminology. So we're going to talk about um, sexual orientation and uh, gender identity. First, I want to clarify the difference between sex and gender. So often we talk about these interchangeably, but they are very distinct terms. So sex is identified by visual observation of genitals at birth and is designated as male, female, or intersex. So this is when you're born, the doctor says, it's a blank. That is a doctor assigning a sex um, and designating a sex to that baby based on how they look. Gender is identified internally by self-knowledge and understanding. And it falls somewhere on a spectrum, including masculinity, femininity, sorry, androgyny, and other terms that we're going to talk about. So again, sex is how your body looks and how a doctor has assigned it. Gender is your own identity, your internally identified um, self, um, self-identity. So I also want to posit that gender is a social construct. So gender is not a completely natural existing um, thing. It is actually what we do rather than who we are. And yet we have a society that is very structured around a gender binary. It is very structured around this belief that people are either boys or either girls, either men or either women. And because our society has been structured so strongly around that belief for so long, it appears that this is natural and biological, um, but that actually gender is socially constructed. If this is either something that is you're interested in learning more about or is new to you and you want to read more about, I put some names down at the bottom of the screen of some major queer theorists who talk about gender as a social construction. So now getting into some terms, again, we're gonna start with terms around sexual orientation and then talk about terms about gender diversity to really make sure we're clarifying the difference between these two. 
So the term gay or homosexual is someone who's romantically or sexually attracted to the same sex. Gay is often used to refer to men who are attracted to men, but it can often frequently be used for women who are attracted to women. One thing to note here is that homosexual is often considered a derogatory or overly medicalized term by some when homosexuality was considered a mental illness in the DSM, homosexuality was the term used, and that's why that term is considered derogatory or medicalized. Um, and therefore, many people prefer the term gay. Um, so this is, if you are talking about um, sexual orientation, I would recommend using gay over homosexual unless the person that you're talking with self-identifies with that. If they use that term for themselves, you can mirror that. Lesbian is a woman who is romantically and or sexually attracted to women um, in the African-American community. Sometimes the term same gender loving woman or SGL is used. And then straight or heterosexual refers to women who are romantically and sexually attracted to men or men who are romantically and or sexually attracted to women. So this is where um, there's opposite sex attraction. More terms around sexual orientation. Queer is a historically derogatory term for um, gay individuals. And this word has been reclaimed by many in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community and allies. Um, it's sometimes used to describe an open, fluid sexual orientation and or gender identity or expression. So um, again, mirroring language that someone is using. So I personally, really value the word queer and identify as a queer woman, that I feel that that word's been reclaimed and is empowering and descriptive of, of a fluid sexual orientation. For some individuals, that term may feel derogatory and they would much prefer any of these other terms you're seeing. So make sure that you're checking in with a person about what their, um, their preference is for how they identify. Um, a big one around queer as well is that using queer as an adjective, not as a noun. So, so not to put an A in front of queer. If you say A queer, that um, is a derogatory term. But um, saying queer woman, using it as an adjective, that's how it's now been reclaimed. Bisexual is a person who is romantically and or sexually attracted to multiple genders, sometimes though not necessarily at the same time. Um, there is some confusion that bisexual means this is individuals who are only attracted to individuals in the binary man or woman, and there are many people who identify as bisexual and, and feel attracted to multiple genders. Um, there is what's called biphobia, which is where bisexuals are often mislabeled as confused, not gay enough. Um, and experiencing stigma due to their bisexual identity. Pansexual is a person who's attracted to people across a range of genders. Uh, pansexual may be used to, uh, by individuals who identify as transgender or genderqueer, um, or who are attracted to people who are transgender or genderqueer. And then asexual or ace, you might hear it as ace for short is um, a person who does not experience sexual attraction either ever or for a period of time. Um, so some asexual people experience romantic attraction, some don't, um, but that's um, what asexual is for ace. Now shifting over to gender diversity. Oh great, we got a question about um, what gender queer means and that is gonna be in our, our list coming up um, for gender diversity. So again, gender diversity is about um, how you identify in terms of gender rather than who you're attracted to. So some basic terms to start with. One is assigned sex at birth. So this is the sex classification that a child is given at birth, usually based on external anatomy. So again, this is when a baby's born and a doctor says it's a blank. Um, Usually individuals are either assigned male at birth or AMAB or assigned female at birth, AFAB. So you may hear someone say that they are um, 
a non-binary AMAB individual. That's an individual who's assigned male at birth, whose gender identity is non-binary. You may also see male to female or MTF or female to male FTM. These terms were common self descriptors for binary transgender individuals. So for an example, MTF would refer to a transgender woman transitioning um, for her, from her assigned sex of male to her identified gender of female. Today, these terms have fallen out of favor as individuals move towards an understanding of gender that's less pathologized and less centered around medical transition. Um, but the, you may, these terms are still used in the literature sometimes and by individuals so you may hear them. So these are some of the most common um, terms related to diverse gender identity. So transgender is an umbrella term referring to people whose gender identity and or gender expression does not fit their sex assigned at birth. Groups who may fall under the transgender umbrella may identify as transsexual, gender queer, androgynous, um, and who may identify as more than one gender. This is often shorted, uh, shortened to trans with an asterisk to represent a wider transgender community. Um, so that's transgender. Gender non-conforming is a person whose gender expression is neither clearly feminine nor clearly masculine, um, or, or who does not conform to mainstream society's expectations of gender roles. Similar terms to gender non-conforming are gender non-binary or gender fluid. So you may hear someone identify as non-binary, gender fluid, or gender non-conforming. And all of those identities I would again refer to someone who is um, whose gender expression and identity is not clearly masculine or feminine and isn't subscribing to society's gender roles. Gender queer is a person who blurs, rejects, or otherwise transgresses traditional gender norms. Gender queer is also used as a term for someone who rejects the gender binaries, this two, this two gender system. And then cisgender is a person who identifies with their sex assigned at birth. So someone who would be non-transgender. So again, um, so right, I identify as cisgender when I was born, a doctor identified me as female and I identify as a woman. A few more terms that you may hear in relation to um, trans individuals that I think can be helpful um, to kind of have these in your, in your lexicon. So one is being read. And so this is, so you might say, you might, someone might say, um, I really want to be read as my, my gender identity or that person's incorrectly read as this gender, even though their identity is something else. So being read is how one's gender is perceived socially by those around you based on factors such as primary and secondary sex characteristics, how you dress, mannerisms, et cetera. So it's, it's the assumptions that people around you make about your gender. Passing is when there is accurate recognition and reflection of one's gender expression by others. So if someone identifies as a woman and people in society look at them and think of them as a woman and see them as a woman, that would mean they are passing. And that can be really important to individuals in the trans community. There's a lot of pressure on trans individuals to pass, to look a certain way, to fit into the gender binary. Self is a um, a choice not to disclose one's medical history, including what sex they were assigned at birth um, and gender affirmation treatments. So this would be someone, you know, an, an individual who um, is transgender, who is not communicating with people around them about that identity. So an example of this, um, I work in a college setting and there may be individuals who uh, transitioned to their gender identity during high school. And then when they start college, they may not tell people around them that they're transgender and may um, live fully in their gender identity. And then dead naming is the practice of speaking aloud or publishing 
a name that a trans person used prior to transition. And I wanna, right, I want to highlight the intensity of the term dead naming, that that is, that name is intense for a reason. It is because this is a name that does not, um, does not match a person's identity that they no longer use because it does not fit their identity um, and using it can be incredibly harmful for individuals. So here is um, just kind of a visual about the, um, the transgender community. So this is kind of this idea of the trans umbrella and all of the identities that can fit under it. And then cisgender would fit outside of this umbrella. There are many people who identify as non-binary or gender queer who don't, don't um, identify as being underneath the trans umbrella. And then there are individuals who are non-binary gender queer who do. So there is a little bit of complexity there, but I think this image can help you see how diverse the trans community is. Um, and then again, just highlighting the differences between sexual orientation and gender identity. So many people confuse these, but gender identity is about who you are while sexual orientation is about who you are attracted to. And they do not have any correlation to each other. Your gender identity does not predict your sexual orientation. You can't guess somebody's sexual orientation by their gender identity or their gender identity based on their sexual orientation. So an example of this would be that whether or not you're cisgender or transgender, you could be um, straight, bisexual, or lesbian. So next, um, I want us to kind of continue thinking about gender on a spectrum and think about the, the different components of gender. So this image is the gender unicorn uh, and it helps break down the different components of gender and separate those out from sexual orientation. So some of these on the gender unicorn refer to gender, some of them refer to sexual orientation. Um, so it's also important to know that our sex, gender, and sexuality are different, but interrelated, culturally dependent, and contextually dependent, right? How we express our gender is very culturally dependent. So to go through this, you have here gender identity, which you can see the unicorn is what they're thinking. So again, that is the internalized self-identified gender that someone identifies as. Gender expression is these uh, blue dots surrounding the unicorn is how someone outwardly presents, how they express themselves. So your gender identity and your gender expression may not match this. And this could be for lots of different reasons. It could be um, someone who is, um, identifies as a gender that's different from sex assigned at birth and they have not undergone any sort of transition, either they don't plan to or they have not done that yet. Um, so they haven't made any changes to how they express themselves. Uh, it could be um, that someone may express their gender differently in different settings. So perhaps when they are at home, they have, you know, they dress in a way that's more consistent with their gender identity, but when they go to work, they dress in a way that is more consistent with their sex assigned at birth. You then have sex assigned at birth that again tends to be um, designated as female, male, or other intersex. Um, about one in 2,000 individuals are intersex. It's much more common than we often talk about. Um, but again, distinguishing that sex assigned at birth is different from how you identify your gender and how you express your gender. And then also separating out regarding sexual orientation, who you are physically attracted to and who you are emotionally attracted to. And that those can be different. You can be physically attracted to genders that you may not be emotionally attracted to or vice versa. 
Um, I think for, especially for asexual individuals who may experience emotional attraction and not physical attraction, again, separating these out can be really helpful. What I also like about this is that the, the spectrums, um, you have these three separate spectrums here for, you know, female, male, other, or masculine, feminine, other. So it's not that you have to move away from one to be closer to another. You could both express yourself as highly feminine and highly masculine at the same time. You could be attracted to, highly attracted to men and women at the same time, those types of things. So here is, you know, to give you an example of if you were to kind of draw out your own gender unicorn, what this might look like. So for me, my gender identity, as I said, I'm a cisgender woman. So I identify very strongly as female, not very strongly as male or other. My gender expression tends to be pretty feminine, but I can be a bit more masculine. I'm a bit more on the masculine for today um, or a bit more other. My sex assigned at birth was female. And then you can see my physical attraction, emotional attraction are a little bit different. So what I encourage you to do is again, you can just Google gender unicorn and you'll get this image. And after this training, I encourage you to explore your own identities by completing the gender unicorn. So you can mark on those um, spectrums where you identify in each of the categories. And you can reflect on what did you observe about yourself? Kind of psychologically, how do you know these things about yourself? Kind of what parts of yourself did you need to access to answer these questions? And how does this exercise maybe help you understand gender? This can be something you do after this training that I think can be just really great to, again, think through how you know your own gender, how you know your own sexual orientation. Okay. So I'm going to um, move on to talking about pronouns. So pronouns, um, are you know, the most common ones would be she, her, hers, he, him, his, they, them, theirs. So they're how we refer to someone without using um, nouns or proper nouns. A gender neutral or gender inclusive pronoun is a pronoun which does not associate a gender with the individual who is being discussed. So these, so a common one is they, them, theirs, right? There's no gender assigned to that. Or there are, um, what are called neo pronouns, pronouns that um, are not kind of pre-existing words in, um, in a language like z here hears, they them zeers. And again, those do not assign any gender to a person. Another kind of um, going along with pronouns, a gender neutral uh, honorific is mix. So rather than using ms, mr or mrs, you can use mx or mix to um, not assign a gender to someone and still um, have a, a more formal um, term for them. So here is a guide that can kind of help you practice using different pronouns. And again, these are in the English language. There are um, different languages are addressing pronouns differently. So there are some languages that don't assign a gender ever to pronouns. And so there's no need to add new um, gender neutral pronouns. There are some that are really highly gendered. Um, and so their um, individuals in, with those languages are also working to come up with gender neutral terms or neo pronouns. Uh, so, you know, for example, in um, Spanish, rather than using uh, L or ella, using AA, E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, the gender neutral version um, of a pronoun. But so this chart can kind of help you practice different sentences with different pronouns. So they laughed at the notion of the gender binary, or they tried to convince Per that sexuality does not exist, or your favorite color is unknown, or uh, the, the pronoun card is theirs and um, A, think highly of yourself. So this chart can be you know, something that you could use to just kind of practice different ones if you're not as familiar with these. What I encourage you to do is to spend some time practicing pronouns that you are not familiar with. 
So they, them, theirs is one of the most common ones. Um, but in general, something you can do is you can just people watch. So you can pick a stranger on the street, at a park, in a coffee shop or restaurant, and first check in with yourself about what assumptions are you making about their gender and, and reminding yourself that they're totally assumptions. This is a stranger. And remember, gender identity and gender expression don't have to match. Um, so you don't know the person's gender, but what assumptions are you making? And then just in your thoughts, practice talking about them using they, them pronouns or other ones just to kind of get in the practice of doing this. So those are kind of my general talking about some terminology and pronouns for a quick overview. I also want to kind of quickly debunk some transgender myths. So these are things that you might think yourself or have heard um, and want to clarify these for everyone. So the first one is, it's easy to tell when someone's transgender. A lot of people think this, a lot of people, because of how transgender individuals are portrayed in the media, often right in, in shows or in movies, it's often cisgender individuals being made up and, and playing transgender individuals. There's this idea that um, transgender people do not pass, right, as, um, as their gender identity, and it's easy to tell. And this is actually a, a harmful myth because just like all people, trans individuals look and express themselves in an infinite number of ways. You cannot tell if a person is trans just by how they look. Um, the second myth is that everyone who is transgender undergoes a physical transition. And this is also not true. So there, most recent survey um, on this was about 10 years ago, and it found that about two thirds of transgender or gender non-conforming respondents medically transitioned, and then one third surgically transitioned. So about two thirds in terms of medical transition that would involve hormone therapy, and about one third surgically transitioned. But about 14% of trans women and 72% of trans men say they never want full genital reconstruction surgery. And as you can see here, right, about a third of respondents never underwent any medical transition. You do not need to physically transition to be transgender, um, right? Again, this is coming from an overemphasis uh, and medicalizing of trans individuals' bodies. And it is this, um, this overemphasis on trans people needing to pass, right? needing to look fit into our gender binary. Another myth is that being transgender is relatively new. And this is also not true, that there is well-documented cases of trans individuals in many indigenous, Western and Eastern cultures since antiquity. Um, you know, one, one kind of parallel that people make to this is if you look at a chart of people who identify as being left-handed, uh, when, being left-handed was really stigmatized and people who were left-handed were really forced to learn how to be right-handed. There was way fewer left-handed people. And then once that stigma was relieved, a lot of people who were naturally left-handed started being left-handed and there was this curve that eventually flattened out, but it kind of went up and then flattened. And you see that exact same Curve with transgender individuals, that as cultures and communities are becoming less stigmatizing around trans individuals, more people are feeling safe and comfortable to come out as transgender. And therefore, we're seeing more numbers more openly. That doesn't mean that more transgender are starting to exist. And lastly, another myth that I think is really important to counter is that people in Massachusetts are not generally transphobic. You know, you know, I think many of us probably on this call live in Massachusetts and view ourselves as a liberal, progressive, open community. Um, and to recognize that while we are in the Northeast and while we may be a more accepting community for trans individuals in other parts of the country or world, 
trans individuals in Massachusetts still experience very high rates of mistreatment, discrimination. Um, so here are just some, some numbers from the 2015 transgender survey that almost a quarter reported being mistreated in their workplace, Almost three quarters of students K through 12 who were perceived as trans experienced mistreatment. 20% experienced homelessness and 20% of those avoided staying in a shelter due to fears of being mistreated. A third limited how much they ate or drank to avoid using public restrooms. Over half who interacted with police reported being mistreated based on their gender identity. And almost a third reporting reported at least one negative experience with a healthcare provider. So these are right. These are the numbers just in our state that we want to be addressing. And I want to take a moment of the urgency of affirmation. How important it is to affirm trans individuals in their identities. So the mean age of awareness that one is trans is about thirteen and a half. And when trans individuals um, experience family rejection or non-affirmation as a kid, it comes with increased rates of suicidality. Um, either suicidal ideation, attempts and self-harm, depression and anxiety, eating disorders, substance use disorders and tobacco use, unprotected sex and rates of HIV transmission, homelessness, placement in foster care system, and involvement in the juvenile justice system. So in terms of rates of suicide attempts, over 50% of transgender male teens, 30% of transgender female teens, and 42% of non-binary youth attempt suicide. These are really high numbers and they're really numbers that we need to address. And the good news is simply using someone's preferred name and their preferred pronouns, that is suicide prevention. There are studies showing that when you honor an individual's identity simply by using their, their accurate name and pronouns that they are asking you to use, that reduces suicidality and suicide attempts. So it's really, we can all do this, right? We can all work to reduce rates of suicide just by doing this. I think that's incredibly powerful. And so I wanted to just give some examples and some tools about how you can avoid using terms that would indicate gender so that you can avoid uh, inadvertently misgendering someone. You know, there have been many times where I've been with um, trans individuals in my life at a restaurant and the waitress has said, you know, hey ladies, what do you want? And just that can really ruin someone's day. So thinking about how you can just take out gender language. So rather than saying something like, you know, I, I, these are all kind of examples of library, um, things you might hear in a library, but you can extend these anywhere. But like, how may I help you, miss, can simply be, how may I help you? Or, all right, boys and girls, it's story time. Can be, all right, everyone, it's story time. Terms like everyone, folks, y'all, all are really great gender neutral terms. Or you can shift things around, like rather than saying he is here to meet with Megan, you can say Megan's 3 p.m. meeting is here. So just thinking about ways that you can reduce gendered language to reduce times that you may inadvertently misgender someone. Because again, you can't assume someone's gender and you don't know. Um, so I'm gonna leave you with a few resources. So these are really great sites to get some additional information. So there is Fenway Health, the Human Rights Campaign and the American Psychological Association. I'll have a lot more information around supporting transgender individuals. And with that, I wanna move us into questions. All right, Dr. Peters, uh, fantastic job as expected. Uh, we do have uh, about, uh, first of all, we have about, uh, what do we have? Around 200 or so people on the call. So I wanna see lots of questions in the Q&A box, folks. Uh, our first question comes from an anonymous attendee. At what age, uh, do you begin having conversations with children about how they identify? And as the teacher, how do I ensure that students' families are ready for these conversations? Great question. So um, research shows that children tend to start like 
being aware of gender. Children are starting to be socialized to their gender from often from before they're even born, right? If, if a parent um, finds out on a sonogram the sex of their baby, we have gender reveal parties. A lot of baby clothing is very gendered. So they start to be socialized to that right away, um, but they start to like, to really start grasping the concept of gender somewhere between four and six. So that's often when, when children might start to be able to kind of identify who's a boy or who's a girl or how they identify. Um, so that can be a time to start having those conversations. Um, you know, people are starting to actually raise children gender neutral. So they're using maybe they, them pronouns, um, not sharing outwardly the sex of their children and are allowing children to identify their own gender when, when they start to fully understand that um, and when they can share that. Um, I think as a teacher, it can be really tricky, right? Because parents may have very different opinions about this. So I think you can do your best to remove gendered language from what you're using to remove kind of gender stereotyping that might be happening in a classroom. Um, yeah, I think that's, that would be my kind of my place to start as a teacher with younger kids. Um, yeah. Great, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Peters. Uh, next question uh, from another anonymous attendee. My child prefers they, them pronouns. How can I best support them? Awesome, use them. That's, that is the way you can best support them. I'm so glad you're here. And really by um, honoring that, um, that identity and those pronouns, that is, again, it's huge. So, um, Another thing is when kind of when we misstep because right using they them might be really new for you. Um, so the, the kind of best way to approach a misstep is as soon as you recognize it, self correct it. Kind of briefly note it, apologize, self correct, and move on. So right, if you say to your child, I don't, I don't know their sex assigned at birth, but if you say oh yeah, he's going into eighth grade. Sorry, they're going into eighth grade. I think they're really excited about it, right? So you, you correct it yourself, you note it, but you don't make a huge deal about it, right? Something that can often happen is people can talk about the effect that their kid's gender identity has on them, right? That it can be really hard to practice these new pronouns to, to kind of change your view of your child. And while all of that is valid and you absolutely deserve spaces to talk about that, those aren't to your child, right? Your child doesn't need to take on the burden or the guilt of this being hard for you. So the message to them is, yep, I'm doing this. It is, it is not a burden to change this. I'm working on it and I'm gonna keep doing it. And then those feelings of you know, any confusion or hardships can go to spouse, friends, um, therapists, other spaces. That would be my recommendation. Um, I think also, yeah, asking about, ask, you know, asking about them, seeing if there are any resources they want to get involved with, does their school have supports, those types of things. So Maria has a great question. Uh, I find it quite awkward to state the pronouns when in an introduction situation. Is it rude not to do it when others are? Yeah. So, my recommendation is to give your pronouns. Um, people, you know, do have, there are different thoughts about this. The, uh, the kind of majority of individuals in the trans community communicate that having other people share their pronouns is really beneficial in, um, because it normalizes naming pronouns and it signifies to them that this could be a safer space. And so, I think the, the kind of question I would have you reflect on is kind of what, what feels awkward about it? Um, because if it's that, like it's not, you're not used to it, part of it may just be the practice. Uh, Cause definitely when I first started, hey, I'm Shannon, she, her, hers, that felt a lot harder. And now that's, that's my kind of, that's my go-to. And also thinking about how trans individuals who do use non-binary or gender neutral pronouns 
they have that awkwardness every single time, right? If they're being the ones to name these pronouns, if they're being the ones to name it first, that you doing this and creating this culture at your workplace, at your, in your communities can really help share the burden with them. Great, uh, an anonymous attendee asks, why so many different pronouns? Why not have one gender neutral one? Great question. Um, and there's, you know, there's a few, many different reasons for this. Um, part of it is that, right, our, in English, you know, didn't have necessarily um, a really great clear option for gender neutral pronouns. So they, them is the most widely used, but there was a lot of blowback about that being a plural pronoun and not a singular. Um, for everyone's knowledge, Webster Dictionary has formally recognized they, them as a singular pronoun. So it is fully grammatically correct to use they as a singular pronoun, but that just happened within the last few years. Um, so there was a lot of like, okay, they, some people had an issue with they, so let's make up a new one, but you had lots of different communities in different areas making up different ones. And so really it was that our language didn't have the capacity for this. And so people were trying to problem solve this all at once. And then language has power, right? Language, we use this to communicate meaning and community and identity. And it's really in meaningful and important and so once these terms were created, people may identify more strongly with one or the other. Um, so it really is, I know it can be challenging. Um, and there are individuals where they, them is not their pronoun. It is easier and practicing that and honoring that for them is really important. And I think by answering that question, you answered another question that was asked. So I'm gonna skip that one. Uh, Joanna asks, can you make any suggestions for a non-binary word in place of aunt and uncle? Oh, great question. I have not heard one for aunt and uncle. So the non-binary term for a niece or a nephew is nibbling, which I love. I have two nibblings and they're fantastic. Um, but, I have not heard a good term for aunt or uncle. I've heard people try to like mesh them together and go with uncle. Um, I, you know, some people might um, kind of go back to a culture or a different language that matches their culture and use a word that is less gendered. So, but I, again, right, this is why, this is where um, multiple words get made because there are tons of people with, siblings who have children who are related to that child and don't have a gender neutral term. And so many people are coming up with different ones right now. And I don't yet know which one we'll land on. We kind of nibbling was what we landed on for niece or nephew, but the society has not landed on one yet for aunt or uncle. Excellent. Uh, another anonymous attendee asks, I am a teacher. Sometimes parents aren't supportive of their child's gender identity and therefore it isn't accurate in our school computer system. I usually do a quote, get to know you survey. Um, is it appropriate to ask for pref preferred pronouns in that form? Yes. So um, going back to the research on um, affirming individual's identities, while it is great for it to be an individual's parents who are affirming their identity, just having one adult in a trans like teenager or youth's life who affirms their identity significantly drops suicidality, mental health concerns. So you can be that one adult in people's lives, even if their parents are not honoring that. Um, and so definitely a, um, a survey is a great way to do that. Some questions depending on kind of how uh, nuanced you want to get with that is you can say, you know, what are your pronouns? What's your preferred name? Um, you can also ask like, are these, do you want me to use these pronouns in front of other students or in front of your parents or not? Like what name do you want me to use in front of other students or parents or, um, so that that way, if a student wants to come out to you, but does not want to come out necessarily to their class or isn't out to their parents, you can also have that clear in the survey. 
another anonymous attendee asks, I volunteer with a group of young people. They all shared their pronouns, uh, and I'm not sure how to use some of them. Uh, for example, when to use which pronoun. Uh, one person said she, her, uh, and I'm going to mispronounce some of this. I apologize, uh, Shannon. Uh, she, her, E-M, and Fei Fem. Another person said he, X, X, M, it. Um, so um, any, any comments or feedback for this anonymous attendee? Yeah, definitely. So um, again, those are all right what I talked about in terms of neo-pronouns. So those are words that are not in our language, but um, that are being developed to uh, signify gender neutrality. Um, so there are a few things that you could do. So you could right go back to some of those I think are on the chart that I gave. And so you can see what they are for, you know, what's the difference for they, them, theirs, and practice um, can be a way to do that. When someone lists like, you know, I think you should she and a, um, that means that sometimes means that they can use those interchangeably. It sometimes means that they may be gender fluid and sometimes prefer one over the other. The really important thing is if someone uses a binary pronoun like she or he and something else is to not just default to she or he because that's not honoring um, the, the gender diversity that they're expressing. So I would recommend practicing the the X or um, other ones. Um, it's hard, yeah, without, you know, I don't think I remember all of them to, to kind of practice, but these like, you can go back to that chart I gave if they're on there. Um, a lot of neo pronouns you can Google and it'll give you all the different forms. And then it really, again, is just comes back to practice. All right, and uh, in the interest of time, we did have a lot of questions on those types of pronouns. Uh, I think we're gonna leave those there for now. Um, lots more questions. Uh, another anonymous attendee asks, I have sometimes seen a person list two pronouns. For instance, she uh, hyphen they. Uh, would that mean that either pronoun is affirming and okay to use? Yes, great question. So yes, so that person, as I just said, um, may use them, at, may feel they identify more as one or another if they're gender fluid, or may be okay using them interchangeably. Again, the big thing about that is to not just a default to the binary pronoun, but to, to really honor and use them interchangeably or to ask the person if they have a preference of when to use one or the other. Uh, another, and, and for all I know, this is the same anonymous attendee, but I suspect it's not. Uh, another anonymous attendee asks, could you talk uh, more about non-binary and gender fluid people? Do they feel differently day to day? Great question. So it depends on the individual. So the uh, non-binary community is really diverse. And so some individuals may feel very stable in a non-binary identity and um, simply that that identity does not fit within our socialized male or female. Or individuals may be more fluid on that and some days may feel um, more masculine or more feminine or more outside of the binary. And that can shift, it can shift day to day. It can shift during different um, life, kind of what's going on in your life. And that also, it can kind of shift how people are expressing themselves. So kind of how, how in sync they feel with their identity and their expression can also change. So that again, totally depends on the person. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, what is your advice to a teacher who will have an elementary student that is newly transgender? My student will switch to a boy name and dress differently. Do you advise speaking with the class to answer questions and set expectations or just let things happen organically? Yeah. Um, so that's really exciting um, that he's gonna be in your class. I, I would probably recommend also communicating with the parents um, to talk with them and to talk with him about what, what they all want. Um, because I, I think it could really depend, right? Have the parents already like, do all of his friends already know and this has already been addressed or are there a lot of students that this will be new for? Um, generally, children are 
um, much more accepting of trans individuals than adults are. And so I think also a big part of it is you coming in with the confidence and the support for that student of, yeah, he's in our class. Um, if someone else misgenders him, you know, polite, like the same kind of politely correcting the student and moving on, it doesn't need to be a huge thing, but like, oh yeah, he blah, blah, blah. Um, and you modeling the name, um, I think those, that, that modeling for students also goes a long way, but I would also loop in the parents um, to see what they would like and what he would like. So Dr. Peters, are you uh, okay with us uh, sticking around for an extra five to 10 minutes and answering some more questions? Absolutely. All right, so I'm gonna make it socially acceptable for folks to drop off. We have hit eight o'clock, uh, but feel free to stick with us. We're gonna go another five to 10 minutes. Uh, I am recording this presentation and you will receive the recording via email tomorrow morning. Um, so don't feel guilty about uh, logging off, but uh, we'll go for another five to 10 minutes. We've answered about a dozen questions and we've got another dozen questions to go. Ho hopefully we can get to at least half of the questions remaining. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, do you have recommendations for books, both fiction and nonfiction, if we'd like to learn more about this topic? Oh, great question. Um, so for transgender individuals, there are definitely tons. Um, the ones that are coming to mind right now are more um, kind of more research heavy that I definitely should have a list prepared for that because that's such a great question. Um, there are like, there are children's books um, on like with trans, um, kind of main characters in them. Um, I just read like if there's a young adult book, Cemetery Boys, um, mm -hmm. that has a, a trans Latinx main character. That's a great fiction book. Um, let's see. Um, I'm wondering if Fenway Health might also be a great resource. I think they might have a reading list, um, but I have not gotten asked that in a while and I'm gonna develop one. <laughs> You are speaking to a bunch of library users, Shannon. That we should have I, why did I not question. predict that question? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do some homework tonight and see what I can uh, what I can come up with as well. Um, and uh, if you think of anything, uh, Shannon, feel free to email me before ten o'clock tomorrow. I will include any any uh, books you want me to list uh, in the email. Uh, so an anonymous attendee uh, says she's heard the phrase, uh, or excuse me, they've heard the phrase two gender, two hyphen gender. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, so two gender um, would be another term for um, like not being within the binary and maybe identifying with both genders. Um, two gender or two spirit also is often a, um, a term used in indigenous communities. So that might also be another place where you hear that. But again, two gender, two spirit is, um, would fit under the trans umbrella and would um, not identify as only one gender or the other. Great. Uh, and anon you, you've somewhat touched on this, um, but I think it's, it's good to um, ask from a different perspective. Uh, how does, this is from an anonymous attendee, how does one know whether they or them is being used as a singular or a plural? I'm not asking if the singular version is proper, but how can this be navigated without confusion? And I think she, he, they had originally written that um, that sometimes when they heard when they're in conversation and they they heard they hear the word they they turn around expecting to see multiple people. Um, so any any practical advice there? Yeah, and I think really it is the the practice and practice and openness to it may be singular. So if there's not a way to tell in the sentence unless there was a um, like some other singular word in the sentence. So it part of it is just like you don't know yet. Like you've heard you've heard they and you're gonna wait for more information. Um, you know, this I get I um, you know I have a, a sibling who uses they them pronouns and I often say to people, oh my sibling, blah blah blah, they blah blah blah. And people say like, oh, how many siblings? And I say one, they use they, them. And it, you know, helps clarify that. So I think really, yeah, there's not a, 
there's no way to predict it, but to be, to help kind of reframe that you're open to it, I think helps start reducing that um, confusion. Uh, and Shannon, can you remind me, uh, what was the uh, terminology for uh, niece, nephew? The, the uh... Nibbling. Okay. So it's like the niece or, your niece or nephew and your sibling's kid. So it's nibbling 1B. All right, so I think that that uh, addresses Lori's question as well, just in the interest of time there. Um, let me see here. Pilar says, what is a nice way to let waiters or others know that you don't want to be referred to as ladies or ma'am without sounding like you're trying to be difficult? I sometimes feel awkward trying to defend myself since I don't identify as a woman, but I know I sound and look like one to others. Yeah, that's a great question. I think there it's really up to you in terms of how, um, how you want to do that. I think one is really like honoring for yourself that correcting someone when they're misgendering you isn't rude. You have every right to do that. And so if when they say ladies or guys or whatever it is, then, you know, actually um, that's not my gender. Could you use gender neutral language at our table? I think that would be totally appropriate. Um, another thing that you can do that I've, um, I've, been with um, trans loved ones that have done before is just writing a message on a napkin. Um, you know, writing, you know, like, thanks so much for the great service. Our meal was great. Um, you know, please know that not everyone is within the gender binary. And could you, I recommend you use terms like folks or y'all or those types of things with your patrons. Um, so that can be another way to do it. So you're getting the information across, but maybe not having to have that direct, what might feel like a confrontation. So Shannon, uh, we did have some questions asked through the chat as well. Uh, you, mm -hmm. so you may have missed some of those. Um, Linda asks, if I'm designing a survey or database, is there a recommended standard for collecting gender information? Great question. So making sure um, that there is a field for preferred name and a field for pronouns. Those are the two biggest ones. The other thing there is like, where those preferred names and pronouns go in printouts. So this happens in medical settings a lot where they will ask for preferred name or pronouns, but your medical chart still only uses your legal name. It's really big, so that often medical providers miss the preferred name. Um, so, so I think that's the thing about like when you're when you have name and pronouns in in your data, how do you then pull it and how does it make it stay really obvious that there are preferred names and pronouns? All right, we'll take a few more questions. A two part question is, so bottom line is the best default pronouns to use, they, them, theirs. And then um, in terms of like actually using the phrase they would, as, as, a, as a singular, would you, would you say, quote, they is going to the store or they are going to the store? Great questions. Um, I'm hesitant to give like a, a blanket um, what to use all of the time. I do think if you do not know the gender of someone, um, using they, I think is probably the safest. I think then finding, if it is a specific person that you're then interacting with, finding ways to you know share your pronouns and, and ask theirs so that you can update that. But yes, I think, um, they is the, the most commonly used gender neutral pronoun um, and um, can be kind of can be safest. A caveat to that is um, some, you know, there are many um, transgender individuals who want, right, really want to say pass. And so maybe there's a transgender woman who really wants people to be using her correct pronouns if she hers and they them could feel hurtful because that that's not affirming her gender. Um, so I, this is certainly not a perfect system, but I do think the the kind of safest first layer is they. And then yet you would still use are like they are the, something just because that is how we all talk and sounds cleaner. So that is generally what the community does. Um, and it's it was a lot harder to try to switch to they is. Um, 
so that is how kind of how the community has has moved forward with me. All right, and that answer also answered someone else's question. All right, so we have gone 10 minutes over. Uh, Dr. Peters, I'm gonna put you on the spot, um, uh, but we did have several requests in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, would you, since, since I'm sharing the recording, would you mind if I shared your PowerPoint presentation uh, in the email tomorrow or, or would you rather me not? It, it's, it's up to you. Yeah, sure. And I, um, it is updated from the one you have. So I'll send you the most right. updated one. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm seeing lots of positive uh, comments in the Q&A and chat. Uh, one anonymous attendee says, this has been extremely helpful. I feel more confident now teaching and accommodating my transgender students. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful. So uh, uh, Dr. Peters, do you have any last words for us before we wrap up for the evening? I just wanna thank you all so much for coming. Like this, again, by working on being more knowledgeable about gender and using preferred names and pronouns, you can have incredibly significant impacts on people's lives. And just the fact that you've all taken this time out of your evening is incredible. And I am so grateful to all of you. Thank you. And I again want to thank the libraries in Andover, Chumsford, Groton, Lawrence Lowell, Newton, North Andover, North Reading, Westford, Wilmington for partnering with Tewksbury for this event. I want to thank the uh, upwards of 200 folks that we had on the call. And I want to thank Dr. Peters for a wonderful presentation and Q&A. So I encourage everyone to check their emails tomorrow morning. Uh, please fill out that feedback survey. Uh, feel free to share the, the recording with anyone uh, in your life who you feel may uh, benefit from viewing it. And uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Peters. Thank you all. Thank you, Robert. Yep. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye.